Time for Church for Kids. You can be open in your Bibles to the book of 2 Peter chapter 1, it's page 1207. If you're using a pew Bible that's there provided for you, if you need a Bible, we're on page 1207, that's almost to the back. Let the choir get down. Hey, y'all, y'all look good. Come back Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. We'll be glad you did. <laughs> All right, with, with your, uh, with, you've, you've turned there in your, if you've got a paper copy, put your finger there and close it. If you've got an electric copy, turn it over. I want you to say something with me. I think everybody will be able to do this. For God... So, say it with me now, ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him shall not but have and to your, and to keep going with me, to your faith add virtue. To your virtue add knowledge. To your knowledge add Self-control. To your self-control, add perseverance. perseverance. That's right. To your perseverance, add godliness. To your godliness, add brotherly love. To your brotherly love, add love, God's love. Okay, good. I'm glad that y'all didn't really know because <laughs> that's the point of the sermon today. Um, and So let's look at this passage. We'll read it, and then I'll pray. And I'll, I'll, I want you to know... That before today is over, I want you to know beyond any shadow of any doubt that God's word is trustworthy and true and that you can follow it, okay? If that be so, we've got a responsibility with it and to it and for us. You with me? Everybody with me? Okay. Let me read this passage for you. We're going to start in verse 12 and we will go to the end of the chapter. 2 Peter chapter 1 beginning in verse 12. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. What qualities? Two weeks ago, we preached on them. I just asked you to quote them to me, and we couldn't, right? Well, we did as a group, so that was good. So I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. Since I know the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that my departure, after my departure, you may be able at any time, notice that, at any time, to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention As to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Would you join me one more time for prayer? Lord Jesus, in in Jesus' name, I just ask right now that you be with us, that you help us that you guide us, be over us and with us. And Lord, I pray that uh, this day you will be glorified in our life, that we will, we will fall in love with you. And by doing so, we'd want to read your love letter to us, the word and commit it to memory. God, give us grace this day. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Wow. So I told you what I, I hoped you could do eventually, which is to be able to quote those. Because that's what Peter said. I want you never to forget. You know what any time means? Any time. I, I, I often use the, the illustration about an old, uh, uh, well, she's old now, Olympian that was the first American woman to hit a 10 from, in, in uh, gymnastics. She was 
She's from West Virginia, so if you're from West Virginia, you take pride in Mary Lou Retton. And she was asked, what does it mean to be prepared? She said, being prepared means you can roll me out of bed at 12 o'clock, throw me on the floor, and I can do my routine flawlessly. That's being prepared to me. And that's kind of what Peter is telling us here today. The first thing that Peter wants us to know under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wants us to remember these qualities of being a Christian, right? That's what he said in, in the beginning of this text that I read. And Peter uses the, the method of repetition in memorization. He, he's asking you to remember them, so he says, I'm going to keep reminding you of them. I'm going to remind you over and over and over. Have you ever been told something by someone and you really need to know it, and they kept repeating it even after you knew it and you got it, and they kept repeating it and you get a little aggravated? That's kind of what Peter said, I'm going to do to you. I'm going to remind you until you're sick of hearing me remind you because you need these. You, you've got to have these. And, and he says, so I'm going to always remind you of these qualities. But then notice, he gives us a little grace here, doesn't he? He says, you already know them. You're established in this truth. If you come to Christ, let me ask you something. Do you come to Christ just because eh, one day I decide I'm going to follow Christ? Or did you come to Christ because you, he, he courted you and you realized he was what you needed? I mean, you didn't just wake up one day as a sinner and go, you know what? I'm not sure I know who all this Jesus thing is, but I'm just going to make him my Lord and Savior. No, yeah, somebody had been talking to you, you've been coming to church, or a friend had been talking to you about the Lord. And then suddenly, one day, it seemed like, Wow, that makes perfect sense. Well, that establishes you in Christ when you come to him and you seal it in your own mind and heart and by public testimony through baptism. That's, what, that's why we're called Baptists, in case you didn't know. We're a Baptist church. That means we believe in immersing people after they come to that place of faith. And Peter says, Peter here says, I know that you're already established in the truth. You, you've believed it. You got it. You've got that foundation. And then he goes on to say, I think it right, uh, as long as I'm in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. I want to keep reminding you and stir you up. Because why? We might, we might fall back in our virtue. We might fall back in our steadfastness. We might fall back in our brotherly kindness to one another. Or even agape love, which calls us to love people no matter what they're like or who they are or what they do. Y'all know that's how God loves, right? God loves us. When we give him nothing, he loves us still. The Bible says in Romans that, that when I was still a sinner, he died for the unrighteous people like me. And so we, we're grateful of that. And then he says, since I know the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. He's saying, I'm going to leave this body. In fact, in these passages, he uses the word exodus. And if you notice as you go out, there's these lit signs over the door. It says exit. We get that from the word exodus, from the Hebrew word. And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exit my body. I'm leaving. Notice he didn't say his body was him. He said he was what was inside and it was leaving the body behind. And so he says, as my Lord Jesus Christ made clear, if you want to see where that is, read uh, uh, the book of John chapter 21. That's where Jesus talks to Peter about how he's going to die. Which is, you know, a great marketing method to get somebody to really believe and buy into everything. Like, if you follow me, there's how you're going to die, and it ain't going to be fun. Right? Doesn't that make a lot of sense? No. It doesn't in our, in our mind, but, but Christ always gives us the cost. But notice this, and this is where that word exodus is, exodus is found. And I'll make every effort so that after my departure, my exodus, at any time... You'll be able to recall these things. You already know them. You're already established in them. But he wants to remind us, what is his motivation in reminding us? Well, it's for, number one, our good, right? He wants us to know them because they're good for us and they will help us. And, and, and they will, if we live in those, we'll be living like Christ did. But Peter is eager for you to get it because he says, I'm about to leave. I know I'm going to leave soon. This not going to leave you physically. I'm leaving everybody. I'm going to be with Jesus. It might not be fun, but I'm ahead now. And so he wants to make sure he leaves behind a legacy. But it's a good question. What, what are they going to say at your funeral without lying? Right? What will people remember about you 
when you're gone. Peter says, I want you to remember virtue and steadfastness and love and all these things that he listed, these qualities. I, I, I got a rough side of my family. And my family, especially on my mom's side, you're either a cop or a crook. You're either in prison or we put you in prison. One of the two. And one of my cousins passed away. And the pastor got up and he said, this is the meanest man I ever met. And all his family said, amen. That's right. Praise <laughs> We knew it. I was just so glad that he didn't lie about it. But then he all said he's the kindest, most generous man he ever met, which was also true. What do you want people to remember you? Peter says, I want you to remember that I reminded you of these things. And you are looking at Jesus. And that's where he goes on that we need to look at Jesus. The second thing Peter says is that he wants us to trust God's word because it is God's word. Now, let me... Caution you, if you grew up in church, you're already a Christian, and you're talking to someone who doesn't know Christ, never gone to church, all that stuff, or they're arguing for a point, uh, and by argue, I don't mean yelling, I just mean making a case for something that we know is wrong because of Scripture, but they don't know Scripture, and you say, well, because the Bible said so, that doesn't mean anything to them. You realize that, right? But here's the good news, what God said in Scripture makes sense, if you can understand it. So you can explain it. From that standpoint, and Peter wants us to, as believers, to trust God's word just because it is God's word. And then build our life on that so that we can explain to other people why God said what he said. It's not enough to know what he said. We got to put it in our life and live it out. And so he, the following verses here, he wants to give us the assurance that what he is teaching and what others are teaching, because he's going to mention someone else, that they are the scripture, they are the word of God. First of all, in verse 16, he says, I know it because I was an eyewitness to it. Now, only he and James and John are eyewitnesses to this event. James is dead. John's going to outlive Peter. So you've got a club of two when Peter is putting to paper what the Holy Spirit is inspiring him to write, which we'll see in a second. So think about that. That's a really small club, right? Because he's talking about transfiguration on, on, he calls it the holy mountain. And it was Peter, James, and John, and Jesus. And Moses and Elijah happened to show up. And they talk with Jesus. And the other three boys are just freaked right out. Peter wanted to build some tents for them to stay in. And let's just stay up here on the mountain with these guys. This is really cool. Because Jesus went from looking like us to being transfigured into his glory so he could have a conversation with Moses and Elijah and somehow their eyes were open they could witness this event and he says we didn't follow a cleverly devised fable somebody didn't tell us that Jesus went up on a mountain and got transformed I just told you the story and you go yeah right two guys from thousands of years ago came back in some form and talked with a man on top of a mountain gotcha you're crazy I'm out y'all realize that when you believe the Bible people think you're crazy because the Bible's got crazy things in it you know that, right? Like a man gets swallowed by a whale that vomits him up three days later on the shore. And then he goes and preaches and an entire city full of evil people repent. That doesn't happen. Axe heads swim. Donkeys talk. How about the biggest one of all? Jesus came back from the dead bodily. So don't tell me, oh, that's just all crazy stuff, preacher. No, it, it is crazy. But when you accept the God of the Bible, the truths of the Bible are not hard to believe. When you, when you serve, we just sang about the Almighty God. And so he says, Peter is sure of the truth because he's an eyewitness. And then he describes that event on, on the Mount of Transfiguration. He said, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw it. But he could also be referring to after the resurrection. But he specifically says it. He says, he received honor and glory from God the Father. And the voice born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son in whom I well please. When did God say that? He said it right after Peter said, hey, look, Moses, who represents the first five books of the Bible that we call the law. And there's Elijah that represents all the preachers of the Old Testament, uh, all those prophets and the prophetic books. Elijah is kind of the representative of that. In Jewish thinking especially, they say, The law and the prophets. You'll hear Jesus saying that. You read that in the law and the prophets. Talking about Moses and all the prophets in the Bible. So when Peter sees that, he's like, hey, let's hang out with Moses and Elijah. Two of the biggest Jewish heroes in all religious Judaism. And God says, this is my beloved son. Hear him. 
I want you to catch that. Why did God say that? Because Moses and Elijah and the books don't count? No, of course they count. But he was saying that all of that is about Jesus. That it's all interpreted through who Jesus is. And so therefore, listen to Jesus. And what did Jesus tell us? You search the scriptures. In them you find eternal life. And these are they that talk about me. And Peter says, we were eyewitnesses of that event. And he tells us that God the Father pointed out to listen to Christ. And Peter moves from that. And thirdly, he assures us that though he's in a very small club of now two people, was three, and one died, one was martyred. The second martyr of the church was the Apostle James, the brother of John. He said, you got a better word. You got something more secure, more sure. Now I ask you, what is more sure than an eyewitness? Several of you, I'm sure, I, I, I would almost guarantee it, if you are outdoorsy at all, like if you go into your backyard, there's been a time in your life where you've been walking along, whether you're in the woods, on a trail, or in your backyard, and you saw a stick and you jumped like it was a snake. I have found, I grew up on the coast, I found I scream just as loud when seaweed brushes my leg as when a shark does. <laughs> and in that first second, I'm convinced I'm about to die under the jaws of a jaws, right? So how faithful is your eyewitness account? Peter said, man, I, you, you may say you're crazy. You, you might, might have been. And look what he goes on to say, beginning uh, here in verse uh, 17 I mean 18 we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven because we were with him on the holy mountain and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed he's saying we have God's word fully confirmed so we're going to look at how it was fully, con fully confirmed just a second and he, then he says and you'll do well to pay attention to it like a lamp Shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. I heard a phrase one time and I had trouble forgetting it. And I hope I never do forget it. What happens when someone comes to Christ and says, I believe you are God the Son. I believe that you put on a human body, became a human. You lived a sinless life. You died for me on a cross, was buried, and you rose again. And I want to believe in you. I want you to forgive me of my sins and follow you. What happens to that person who... Submits himself under God in that way. Well, I, I, I won't take vocal ones. I'll just go ahead and tell you. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside you. Right? And the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He is not it. He, he is a he. He's a person. He's just like God the Father. Just like God the Son. But he lives in the believer. And Paul says, we have this powerful God living in a jar of clay. This is just a, my body's just a jar of clay. And so... He's about to tell us that the Holy Spirit gave us the Word of God. And I will tell you, you can't understand Scripture apart from the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit gives enlightenment to our, not to our brains. Uh, we say to our eyes to understand it, to behold it, and know what he's talking about. And he says, we have this prophetic word more fully confirmed. And you do well to pay attention to it like a lamp shining in a dark place. And here's the phrase. I know where I left off the trail. I came right back to it. The phrase I heard is that we have a light on our path and we have a presence in the dark. See, when I'm afraid to go outside at night when I was a little boy, my mom told me to go out to the shed and get a loaf of that frozen day old bread that she would buy in bulk and freeze because we couldn't afford to buy the fresh stuff. <laughs> it's because she ran out of bread and needed to make sandwiches for tomorrow and it was really dark and I'm in Charleston and I go out there and and when I unlocked that door, I'm going into a little tool shed that was my dad's. It didn't have walls in it, just had studs. Light switch hanging here. Y'all, the men might remember this. Ladies, you may never have noticed. But back in the day, it was like, it almost looked like cotton around wiring. That was the insulation. Well, we had all that. And you were afraid if you missed the light switch, you're going to electrocute yourself to death. <laughs> so I'm a little boy. I don't want to go out of there. And when, you t and when you do manage to turn the light on in Charleston at night in a shed, it's not mice that run. It's roaches <laughs> gone and I'm not talking about these little bitty ones I'm talking about the big ones and then I got to open the freezer and it was that kind that kids play in and don't survive so cruelty to children right there right and I got to open it up I don't want to go out there and do all that 
Daddy, can you go with me? Sure, son. Sometimes he just stand on the back step and watch me. But as long as he was there, I wasn't afraid. Didn't think about the roaches, didn't think about the light switch, didn't think about anything except just doing the job because dad was, had his eye on me. I'm going to be okay. I don't have those same fears anymore, but I got a better presence. I got the presence of the Holy Spirit with me. And we have what he inspired men to write down to light our path. So that when that light switch comes on, the roaches do run. And we know what God's pure and good and clear, refreshing water is. Because look at what he says in verse 20. Knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Now, in studying for this, and, and, and this has always been a little bit of confusing to me too, but as I was reading up what other people said about it, one guy said, this confuses everybody. But he gave a bunch of examples of why it shouldn't, and I think he was right. He said, because it's, was it they wrote what they wanted, or that... Is that the problem? What does private interpretation mean they were the author? Or does it mean our understanding of what they wrote? And the answer is yes. God helped them write it and God helps us understand it. It's a double meaning that Peter uses. He's saying it's not a, it wasn't originated from a private guy, you know, like Joseph Smith did with the Book of Mormon. Or the followers of Buddha did 700 years after he was dead. The scripture was inspired by God and it is illuminated by God to our understanding do you understand what I just said just you can shake your hand okay good yes I just want to make sure I'm being clear sometimes I might not say it very clearly and and so Peter says we have a the word of God because God the father points to Jesus Jesus points us to the Bible the Bible tells us all about Jesus from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation it's all about Jesus Christ and, and, and not that God the Father, God the Holy Spirit are less. They're not. They're equal. They're all equal in power and glory, majesty, authority. They just have assigned themselves different roles. And Jesus is the one that came and paid the price so that everything that God promises in Scripture, we can now have because he bought it for us. Like I could tell you I'll buy you a brand new car tomorrow, but I don't have the bank money to do that. I could sell everything I got. I wouldn't have the money to do that. But there might be somebody in this room that could write you a check, not feel it, and get you a new car. They got the power. God had the power to give us everything he wanted, and he did it because Jesus died for us on the cross. And you can look that up in 2 Corinthians in chapter 1. And this word here about being inspired means they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. It's been illustrated this way, and it's true. It means to make full or to kind of move someone. It's been illustrated like a wind in the sails of a sailboat. It catches the, the, the sail doesn't power the boat. The wind powers the boat. The sail just catches it. And so the men were the canvas, and God moved them to write God's word to make sure we have the correct word. And so the scripture is not of a private origin or interpretation. Look at the next chapter, verse 1. I'm not going to preach on this, but look what it says. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves a swift destruction. He's saying there are people who will come and they will lie to you, and you need to know where is the truth. The truth is in the revealed word of God in the scripture. We, we use the word, the word of God, in a couple of ways. Number one, Jesus is the word of God. Number two, the Bible is the word of God. Jesus is the living word. The Bible is the written word. And when we yield the written word, the sword of the spirit, the Bible calls itself, that the living word of God can effectuate that in people's lives so they can understand who God is and what he's given for them. Look at chapter 3 and verse 16 of Second Peter. So just one more paper. He's talking about Paul, verse 15, and count the patience of the Lord Jesus, uh, the Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote you according to the wisdom given to him. He's given Paul the credit of, of being on the level of scripture as he does in all his letters when he speaks to in them of these matters. And there are some that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist their own destruction. 
as they do other scriptures. He's saying what Paul wrote down was scripture, and he wrote 13 books in the New Testament, so that's a good thing he's listening to God, amen? Or else we'd be following one of those false teachers. And so, the, the understanding and the origin is in, not in men, but in God moving in men. But I want to also give you some proofs that the Bible is from God, both some external proofs and internal proofs. Just a few. There's just a few. There, there's tons. We call what I'm about to say apologetics. I mean, it's not an apology. It is the reasons why we can believe it. I'll just give you a couple. Uh, first of all, the Bible has one author, God, right? But it has over 40 human authors. Over 40 different men wrote this. Now you get 40 men, get them together, say, I want you to write on this topic. You will get 40 different ideas that don't, can't both be true at the same time. Nobody's going to agree. They might agree on one little point or that little point, but it won't be consistent throughout. But we have over 40 authors that speak about one subject, and they don't contradict each other ever. We got a whole word. That's an ex- that doesn't happen. You see, we, we kind of think, I, I referenced the Book of Mormon earlier. Well, see, Joseph Smith, you know, God gave him the ability to, to write those, those scriptures. Uh, the other one, his name is Russell. I forgot his first name. His last, his last name was Russell. And he's the founder of Jehovah Witnesses. And he translated the Bible. And so in a court of law, they said, can you read Greek? And his lawyer, knowing what, what he said, yeah, or, you know, do you write, yes, do you understand Greek? And he, and he said, yeah, and they handed him a page of Greek and said, read it. And his lawyer, being a smart lawyer, jumped up and said, wait, can you now understand Greek? He said, oh, no, not now, but I did when I was writing it. He just took the King Jimmy and changed it. I'm sorry, King James Version of the Bible, sorry, that slipped out, I called it King Jimmy. I carried that all the way through seminary, even though there were modern translations, so I, I, I still think in those terms. Multiple authors, and they don't disagree. And in other writings, they didn't write anything down, Buddha said, for 700 years. And that's another example that this is the Word of God. Time. It was written over 1,200 years span. Thousands of years. Might even be longer than that. And it was written when the people who were eyewitnesses were still living. So that if anybody saw it and read it and heard what they were saying, they could go, no man, I was there. That ain't true. That's what Paul says in Corinthians. There's over 500 people who at one time saw Jesus. A big crowd of people who knew about Jesus saw him alive. And most of them, he said, are still alive. You can go down there and talk to them. And so what they wrote was written by eyewitnesses in the presence of eyewitnesses who could have said that is not true. Don't we see that every day in the news about politicians? Right? I mean, it doesn't matter what side you're on. The side you're not on accuses the side you are on of lying. And they're right 99.99999% of the time, right? So the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. There are some lies bigger than others, however. So it was written in a contemporary time, and yet it has application to us today. It's more, there are more modern authors that are doubted. It's doubtful that Shakespeare wrote everything that we claim he wrote. We can't prove he did. And here's the big one that really helps us. We call it the Dead Sea Scrolls. You might have heard of those. In the 1940s, some shepherd boy was looking for the sheep that got away from him. And he'd go up to these caves. There's multiple caves where this was. And he'd throw a rock in there. Because if he hit a sheep, it's going to, you know. Oh, they're in there. Because he didn't want to go in the cave looking. No telling what else is in there. So he threw one one time and he heard what we would say glass breaking, heard a a clay jar break. That's odd. And within those clay jars, scholars who had been copying the Old Testament for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years had hidden them from the Romans in those caves. And they stayed hidden for almost 2,000 years. And a shepherd boy found them. And when we opened them up, we had multiple things out of the Old Testament there. And guess what we had to change? Nothing. I think one or two letters. <laughs> because it was still, God not only inspired it, he preserved it. You hold a copy of a translation of those texts. And so, 
That's why we keep getting new translations because our language keeps changing. And we got to take what the text said and put it into modern language so we can understand. If you have the King Jimmy, the King James, sorry. I say that. I don't want you to be offended by that. I'm not being offensive. I just, I got in the habit of that. I apologize. The King James Bible says, I do you to wit of the grace of God. Does anybody know what I just said? I want you to know. But back then they said, I do you to wit. I want you to understand. You have wit. You have understanding. I do you. I want you to know this. So we don't say it that way in a modern translation. We say, I want you to know the grace of God. So I'm just saying our language changes. And so we sometimes have new, new versions. People get a little bit out of shape about that. But I'm glad we do because not all of us know Greek and Hebrew. There are internal reasons. It is consistent. I already mentioned that. They don't disagree. Nowhere. Men for, for thousands of years have tried to discredit the Bible. See, those contradictions. Yeah, we don't know about that. Well, it says that, but we haven't found any evidence of that. Archaeology, in case you don't know, only started in the mid-1800s. Archaeology is a brand, really almost a new science. There, there was some, but it's, it didn't catch on till then. And guess what? They keep finding stuff that the Bible said that we didn't know before was actually happening. So it's very consistent. Internally, it's honest about the flaws of its heroes. I have never read a novel about a hero where the, where the hero was so flawed he couldn't do what he was doing. The Bible said this, this guy really failed. This guy, every hero in the Bible, except Joseph in the Old Testament, Joseph in the New Testament, and Jesus, they all failed. They failed big. Failure is a path to success for mere mortals. Y'all know that, right? Because you learn better from that, and then you get better, and you do better. But the Bible is honest about the flaws of our heroes. And what it says here is the most practical advice for our lives. That when we read that, if you really understand, well, I can't say all the things, but in modern psychology, if you understood the things that actually are helpful, they're biblical principles. They go off on tangents occasionally and it gets real weird. But everything they're going to tell you that is right is found in the scripture. Everything they tell you that works. And so we have this internal thing, and there's something that's observable. And it's the testimony of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you understand, if you understood John 3.16, 3, that was the work of the Holy Spirit. You don't have the capacity to understand what that means. That God gave Jesus to die on our place on the cross so that we could be saved. You can't understand that apart from God. We have a changed life. I'm not what I used to be. I'm not what I'm going to be, but thank God I'm not what I am, was. And what I am is better than what I was, and what I am is not as good as I'm going to get. My life has changed, and it keeps changing in a positive way. And it's practical help. I, I, I've already said that in many ways. This word gives practical help to us. And Peter says, therefore, I want you to know it. I want you to know it, so if I rouse you out of bed at midnight and throw you in the middle of the living room floor, and what's the qualities in the Christian life? You can just spit them off. You know what they are because you're living them. You're, you're doing it. Well, that starts, what do you say? To your faith, add virtue. Start living like you're saved. Then add knowledge. You better know why you're doing it. And that knowledge comes from reading it, memorizing it, and understanding it. And then when we get that knowledge, we can get some self-control and in self-control we get steadfastness and knowledge and, and all those things which leads us to love to love men and love God and love others with God's way would you pray with me for a little bit here God we thank you for Peter we thank you for the testimony of Peter Lord we look at him in the eyes of authority that he had authority because he was chosen by you he was picked out special and uh, he went through all these uh, circumstances when you were with him. And so we give him a lot of authority. And he writes to us and says, it's not because I've got authority. It's because God does. And this is what God said. And God points to Jesus. And you better follow you, you, Lord Jesus. So we're thankful that the Holy Spirit inspired him to write this. We thank you that Peter, obviously, as we see his life in the Gospels, where he's always making mistakes, always saying the wrong thing, always doing the wrong thing. That as he grew older, he grew more in the grace of God. And he is giving us the advice. Listen, if a guy like me can learn this, so can you. And so, Lord, I pray that we as believers would trust your word. That where it speaks, it will be helpful 
to us. It, it will not lead us to evil. It will not lead us to destruction. It will not lead us to anything bad. It only leads us to your good. But Lord, we need you to help us understand it because we can misunderstand, misapply it. And so Lord, we come and we see the whole volume of the book. We look at everything you say and when we do, we see this beautiful, I don't want to say jigsaw puzzle because that sounds confusing, but we do see this big tapestry, this big picture that you painted stroke by stroke by stroke to give us the completed work of your revelation to us for now. We know we'll learn more when we're with you, but for now, this is all we need. So Lord, may we hold dear your gift to us of giving us your will, your thoughts, your love. And writing it down in a book. A book of 66 books. By many authors over much time in many places. Yet all of it agrees completely. The Book of Mormon it contradicts itself. Russell's translation contradicts itself. They didn't even write Buddha's teaching sounds for 700 years. They don't know if Buddha said that or not. But Lord your word. You gave us the eyewitnesses who wrote it down. In the presence of others so that they could say, wait, you got that wrong. So we know that all of your word is a beautiful picture that comes together. And Lord, we would do well to know it and to pay attention to it and live it out. So Lord, I'm asking for the people here that's hearing me right now. That Lord, they would fall more in love with you through your word. Lord, if we, if, if we love someone and they send us a letter, we want to read it. If it's... From somebody we don't love, we, we don't even have time to open it. And you sent us a love letter to tell us about yourself. And so we ought to open it and read it. And that would change our desire if we were just in love with you. So Lord, give us the love we need. Move in our hearts. And if we are away from you right now, Lord, I just pray that we will come to you. Our, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Pastor Andy's already begun to play for us. I, I don't know where you are spiritually. I know where I am. As not a day goes by, I don't need to start in repentance. Knowing that I have nothing, I have no ability to get anything, and I need God desperately in my life. Maybe you've never been at that place, but maybe you have and you've forgotten it. Or you just need it again. Or you need it for the very first time. What we're going to do next is we're all going to stand up and we're going to sing us another song but I'm going to be standing right here at the front and what I want you to do is just step out from where you've been and just come down here pray at this altar if you want to this, this stage you can bow and pray or if you need to talk to someone come talk to me and I'll make sure that, uh, that, that we have a conversation it might not be right immediately but, but I'll, st- I'll hang back at church and we'll talk but you just come let us know there's a lot of people here that you can talk to and if, if a lot of you come we'll, we'll We'll get some more people to help us out. But let's all stand up. Father, give us your grace now to be obedient to what you've revealed in Jesus' name. As Andy plays, we sing, you come. Oh,
want you to sit down for just a second. I got to put it on my ear if it's going to work, right? Sorry there. Thank you, Austin. Okay. Uh, I, I just want to sit down so you get a better view. Corey, come on down. Valerie, are you still in here? Can you come over too? Uh, this is wife Valerie and Zeke can come if he's still there. Yeah, there he is. Popped up. This is uh, Corey and Valerie Colvin and their uh, son Ezekiel. And uh, with Pastor Stephen returning to where he's going. And by the way, the prayer cards are out there. And when y'all pay him, he can go. Um, when y'all sign up to help. But Corey, um, he's going to be an intern as a youth worker here at the church. And what that means is that basically he's volunteering, okay? And uh, so that's bad. There's no such thing as a part-time Christian worker. It's only part-time pay. That's, the, that's how that works. But uh, he's, in, he's also at seminary. Dr. Lawless is, is helping him there. Um, and all his studies, I'll let you describe it later. But he's going to be working with our, uh, our teenagers. And I call them teenagers, youth. People call them a lot of different things, but that's who they are. And uh, he and his wife are going to be working in that. Uh, and, and at the same time, um, I'm going to be his teacher here and, and mentor him. And um, he's got to do coursework with me and stuff. It's going to be a lot of fun. i got to pretend like I'm back in school too. So um, that, that, that's, that's a pain. But anyhow, I just wanted to introduce him because not all of you knew him. And you said, well, why are we going that route? And if you missed the business meeting, we're going to, uh, we're look, going to look for, and, and we've got the, uh, the committee formed up. Uh, we just haven't met yet. We're going to be looking for a minister of education and administration. Um, we need help in both those things. So um, be praying for us as we do that. And grab that mic because you're going to close some prayer in just a second. Not only putting a man on the spot, is it? Um, he's going to pray uh, as, we, as we go out. And uh, so now that you've seen them, maybe you never met them. Now you've seen them, introduce yourself to them. Let them know you're going to be praying for them. Uh, if you want to work with uh, some teenagers, um, let him know that you're willing and uh, he'll figure that part out uh, with you because there's a lot of help he's going to need because he's got a work full-time job. Did, did I mention that? That he's an intern? Yeah. So uh, you guys pray for him, love on him, help him out, okay? Amen? Yeah. Amen. Cor, would you take us out? Yeah. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to be an intern at this church. Lord, we know that Every good gift is from you. We know that I didn't earn this, but you gave me this, and we just glorify your name for that. We thank you that we're able to be here this morning to worship you, to hear your word preached. And Father, I pray that that doesn't fall on deaf ears, but you open our ears and you work in our hearts so that when we leave, we live your word and we continue to glorify you. Your word says that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Lord, we want those who haven't heard your word, to hear it before that day comes when every knee will and every tongue will so that they have that opportunity before it's too late. Father, we praise you. We love you. We thank you for all that you do for us. You are worthy of all of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.